Joining us now is professor at Northwestern University Medical School and a frequent flyer here on The Morning Show, Dr. Lauren Stryker. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We always like to have her in to ask some uh, medical questions. Uh, first up, estrogen therapy and breast cancer. Yeah, this is actually really interesting because women with breast cancer are always told that hormone therapy is out of the question. No matter how bad their hot flashes are, no matter how miserable they are, no way. And this isn't based on science or data. This is based on fear. So a few facts. Number one, women that take hormone therapy have a 22% decreased risk of developing breast cancer. Fact, if someone is using hormone therapy and they get breast cancer, they are 40% less likely to die. They do better. Mm. Fact, if someone is pregnant and they have breast cancer, they don't do any worse. And that's sky high estrogen. And every study that has looked at women who take postmenopause hormone therapy and breast cancer has no higher risk of recurrence and they don't, you know, they live just as long. Where so did this all come from? Because it's, fear, I was, it comes, fear, I've always been fearful that the, that could trigger that. Exactly. That, where was Everybody that? Everybody is, including a lot of doctors. Yeah. So out of fear, they're not prescribing it. So this week in the leading menopause journal, they published a wonderful article that looks at all of the studies of women who with breast cancer who have gotten hormone therapy. And they follow thousands of women for up to 10 years. And what did they find? There was no increased risk of recurrence in these women and their prognosis, how long they lived, was the same. Now, the only caveat is the majority of the women studied had hormone receptor negative breast cancer. The ones that had hormone receptor positive breast cancer also did fine, but they didn't have as many of them. So bottom line is there's Scientifically, no reason that women who have severe menopause symptoms with breast cancer can't get hormone therapy. Was there some bad study done before that made us no. all think that? No, no. everybody was oh. just afraid to do this ah. study. Mm -hmm. So, but the big issue is like, yo, good luck finding a doctor who's going to prescribe it because they all think otherwise mm. and they're all afraid. But meanwhile, there's millions of women who sometimes are years out from their breast cancer and they're not allowed to take it and they feel miserable and it's just... You have to look at the data. Follow the science instead of following the fear. Yeah. All right. Asthma drug for severe food allergies. So, so this is kind of big news for the 6% of the population that has severe, and I mean life-threatening allergies to things like, you know, peanuts and dairy mm -hmm. and eggs, because there's really been nothing to do other than to avoid those foods. And then if someone does get an inadvertent um, exposure, then just give them an EpiPen. So this is actually not a new drug. This is an old drug that's been around for a long time to treat asthma. And like a lot of old drugs, you find a new life for it, a new purpose. And what they have found is that if they give this medication to people with these severe food allergies on a regular basis, that if exposed to that allergen, that they're either not going to respond at all or it's going to be a much less severe response. So just to be clear, this is not something you give to someone once they've had an allergic response. We're still in, you know, using the EpiPen. But in the clinical trial with this, this is an injection, and people were given this every few weeks for about four months, and then they exposed them to peanuts, mm -hmm. to eggs, to the things that were life-threatening, and, and they really did pretty well. And in the clinical trial was both children and adults, anyone oh. over age one. So this is potentially huge. Always a downside, right? Right. Right now, the list price, you don't even want to know. Oh. Mm. Three to $5,000 a month. Oh, my Are gosh. Are you kidding? So, yeah. you know, we'll see what the insurance companies do with this because this is, this is life-threatening yes. stuff. There was a 25-year-old last month in New York. I don't know if you saw this. She ate a cookie and died because it was mislabeled. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. so we're not Crazy. messing it. This is serious, not All to right. mention how much right. anxiety it causes. Right. Yeah. All right, caffeine and migraines. Yeah. Migraine people are always told, avoid caffeine avoid caffeine, which is kind of curious because caffeine is also in a lot of the migraine drugs to alleviate migraines, but they're still told you shouldn't have any caffeine. So this was an interesting study that just came out. They divided migraine sufferers, and we're talking big time sufferers, people that were having migraine headaches three to five times a week, oh. and they divided them into three groups. Group one got four caffeine drinks a day. Group two got two caffeine drinks a day, and group three, they were completely off caffeine. They followed them for months and you know where I'm going with this one. There was no difference between the three groups wow. in either the number of migraines they had or the severity. So the bottom line from this article was if you, someone, if you have migraine headaches, it's okay if you want to have caffeine. The caveat being that it should be a consistent amount. You know, if you're someone who normally has two cups of coffee a day, don't suddenly have six. It seems yeah. to be something yeah. about the change yeah. in caffeine. Mm. But, you know, 
good news. Good, news. Right. good stuff. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can check out Dr. Stryker on social media, and she always has good advice. Thanks for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Time for On Town. Hey, Anna.